Gracious Father, as we come before you this day, we are truly humbled by the grace that you offer, the message of life that you give, and the proclamation of hope that you give us the privilege of hearing and sharing. And so we ask that you would touch our hearts and touch our minds and guide us with your spirit, enabling us to bring true praise to you and a strength to each other. As we look to you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have never offended you, and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you over the boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by which of my office, the called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you, and in his stead, and by his command, I do forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The intro for this morning is Psalm 149. We do read this. Responsible. Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song. His praise in the assembly of the saints. Let them praise his name with dancing and make music to him with tambourine and harp. Let the saints rejoice in this honor and sing for joy on their beds. To inflict vengeance on the nations and punishment on the peoples. To carry out the sentence. This is the glory of all the saints. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. What is the office of the keys? The office of the keys is that special authority which Christ has given to his church on earth, to the of the sins of repentant sinners, but to the whole forgiveness. Almighty and everlasting God, you knit together your faithful people of all times and places into one communion. The mystical body of your Son, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Grant us so to follow your blessed saints in all virtuous and godly living, that together with them we may come to the unspeakable joys you have prepared for those who love you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Would you please?
first lesson we're going to ask found in the book of Revelation, seventh chapter. It begins with verse 9. The pictures that uh, John were given by the Lord in heaven to paint are ones who give us an image of the wonder of what grace accomplishes, especially for all people who believe. It shows how the unity of the church in heaven is how God brings all believers from all times right before his throne. This is the picture we are perceiving. And it's a picture that cannot but help make us smile and have a great deal of comfort about how the Lord is handled, especially on our turn. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes, and peoples, and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne, and around the elders, and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne, and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing, and glory, and wisdom, and thanksgiving, and honor, and power, and might, be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun will not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. The epistle is found in 1 John, the third chapter. It begins with verse 1. The book of 1 John explains the love of God for his people. And this is another little glimpse of what that means. And again, when John wrote, he was trying to lead people away from their own concept of uh, why the Father in heaven would love them. To show them the truth that is always based in the cross. So we see it here once again. See, what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him, because we shall see Him as He is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Would you please rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel? The Holy Gospel for this morning is found in the fifth chapter of Matthew. It begins with verse 1. The Beatitudes are an explanation, and it's a very, it's a remarkable explanation of what justification has done for us. It has given us this transformation in our soul so that we have been given qualities that are truly godly. And these are glimpses of pieces of things we have been given. Some people are given a lot more, some a lot less, but we have all been blessed with these insights to share with this world. Seeing the crowds, Jesus went on up the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you persecute you, and under all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecute the prophets who were before you. Here ends the Holy Gospel. Would you please join me in confessing my faith in the words of the Nicene Creed at the back of the hymn. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and one Lord Jesus Christ, the 
the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten of not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us then, and for our salvation, came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory, to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge with baptism for the remission of sins, and I look at the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Would you please?
and that our sins are not removed because we're out of repentance. He gave it to the church. He put it in the midst of each congregation. The power of the office is in the hands of the congregation. It is never in the hands of the pastor. The pastor does not call a congregation. The congregation calls a pastor. Because God is very wise. He understands that the collective group is much wiser than the individual man. So that if I get off the mark, you will nail me to a tree by his command. And if I step out of line, you will remove me from office by his command. Because he understands that the collective element that he has given this office to is a much better protector of his word than just one man if he held the power of the office. And so I come here because I was called here by you. The Spirit led so that we would serve his kingdom together. But the office was set up with his rules, his determination, and his parameters. He makes it very clear in this office there are only men to serve. Only men are to be pastors. Why? God understands the realm of what he is doing. <clears throat> he placed the burden and the responsibility of the pastoral office upon the man who is supposed to be the head, the spiritual head of the family, and also the spiritual head of the church. We all point to Christ. He did this not because he is sexist or doesn't like women. He did it because there's a structure and order that he understood would serve his church the best. And the only way that you cannot understand that reading the scripture is if you ignore the scripture or put your own emotions before the truth of the scripture. Both are not very enough. The Lord has said, this is my office. You go by my rules. Because I've always Maybe honest is probably the best word. The war I left four years ago, it changed my whole perspective on a lot of things, except for one. This office that I serve. In. The scriptures are very clear. To be a pastor, you can only be the husband of one wife. That means not two at a time. That's not what I was talking about. I was talking about you can only be the pastor, the husband of one wife, unless your wife dies. So to remain a pastor, I cannot get remarried. I've had people say, Pastor, that's not fair. It's not about fair. It's his office. It's about what he has established for a purpose. <clears throat> You have given me this calling, which is amazing. And what I truly feel both humble and remarkably privileged to serve it. Because it's his office. It's one of the things I try to strive and teach, this remarkable gift of this office. Because when my confirmation kids, they fight every year for this question. What power does a pastor have? And what I answer this. None! <laughs> I'll never forget when I had my, when Pastor Keller was doing his confirmation and he had all his kids lined up, and he invited my kids to, do, to watch this questioning. That was the wrong thing to do. <laughs> because he goes, kids, do you got any questions? And three of them held up their hands. And I won't tell you which three. And they said, yeah, we do. We want to ask your kids, what power does a pastor have? And the kids kind of mumbled around. Then they went, none! <laughs> Pastor Keller almost fell off his chair. <laughs> they explained it, as I believe it, what the scripture teaches. The pastor has no power. I don't have any rights or privileges unless you give them to me, period. You called me to do one thing, to preach the name of our Lord. To share the cross of Christ and to preach Christ crucified. This is what you called me here to do. 
I don't have a right to take this office and go to Darmstadt and preach unless you give me permission and Darmstadt gives me permission. I don't have a right to go and do a wedding anywhere outside of this building unless you give me permission to go to that place and do that wedding. I can even do my father's funeral, my own father's funeral, without your permission. It's not my office. And wherever I go as a pastor, I carry your office to wherever it is. It's not mine to carry unless you give me permission. It is God explaining to us the reality of what he has done. He has come into our midst so that he could provide a remarkable thing in the lives of we who are believers. We could hear audibly that we are forgiven. I don't forgive anybody anything. I am a forgiving man. I been taught in God, by God's grace, I do forgive. But when I announce and pronounce absolution, all I am is a voice box. That's it. Because the Lord forgives, the Lord is proclaiming it. I do absolutely nothing. He gives me the privilege of being one who administers. I am able to pour water on children's head and speak the word. I am able to hand out the bread and wine and speak his word. I have no ability to do anything. But it's his means for you. He has set this office up so that I as a pastor could share the grace of God with you. It's an amazing thing to be able to do. Yesterday morning when I was called to the hospital to be with Brandy's family and there's all kinds of people in the room and Brandy was in and out and uh, they were trying to make the decision about if they should drive her to Vanderbilt, and there was just all kinds of things going on. And I had the privilege of saying, why don't we just stop and pray? Now, you know me, I'm German. Uh, they all wanted to grab my hand, and I was getting heebie jeebies, and I told them, no, I can't do that. So I grabbed a hold of Brandy's hand, and they all held their hands together, and we asked the Lord to do exactly what only the Lord can. We have the privilege of doing this. You give me the privilege of taking this office from here and going to a hospital and sharing the grace of God. That's what this office is. It's sharing the grace of God. Sharing it in boldness and strength and, and, and in the understanding that God has given us the right to understand. It is never the pastor. In this world, you know, it bothers me, it does. In this world, we have almost nobody that teaches respect anymore. Kids don't have an understanding of it, and a lot of adults don't have any understanding of it. But my father, when I was a little kid, used to say to me, Kirk, you may not like the pastor, but you better respect the office. You better respect the office. Because it's God's. <coughs> it's why we have the service set up the way we do. Or a hymnal set up the way we do. So that even if the pastor is a complete idiot, before the service is over, you're still going to hear two to three times that you are forgiven by the grace of God. You're going to hear the message of the gospel of the cross. It's all placed there so that even if the pastor is an idiot. And that's what the Lord says, even if the pastor doesn't believe, even if he doesn't have faith, even if he doesn't believe a word he is saying, it will never change what this does. It will never change what that does. It will never change what the announcement of absolution does. Not one little bit. Because the power is in the cross, which has been handed to the congregation not to the pastor. It's one of the things I cherish about how God has done. It's his office that he places in our midst and you better protect it as I better protect it. It's what we do together. If you're out of line, let me tell you, you know I'm going to tell you. If I'm out of line, I have no doubt because you have many times you told me it's the way we work together to protect this office that he has given so that we who need to hear we hear over and over and over again about the grace of God his office his grace for our blessing it is truly an amazing thing our God has done Twenty-eight years I've had 
tremendous privilege. <coughs> I hope I have a few more. That says, I'm making it back to my son. But the Lord is gracious. And it is the message that he gives. That we always hold and understand and cherish what he has placed in the midst of us all. Amen. Would you please rise? Now may the peace of God which passes us all understanding. May you keep our hearts and minds under Christ Jesus. Amen. You may be seated.
So we simply place them into your hands, dear Lord, and ask that you'll guide and direct things according to your will, and place your comfort upon him. For Carl Hoffman, we ask that you would continue to provide healing to him. We thank you for the progress that he is making, but we ask each day, dear Lord, you would continue to give him the determination to work through all the difficulties that he must work through. For Tom, we thank you for the healing that has taken place and ask that you would continue to provide that blessing upon him. For Christy, that you would ease her pain, that you would give wisdom to Dr. Stevens, that you would grant her that insight about the best way to treat her. For Rick and Melinda, that you would handle things in your own way, that you would open up the doors to make it possible for them to proceed with the transplant. For Betty, we ask that you would remain near her, dear Lord, and grant her an uplifting and a blessing. For the election on Tuesday, dear Lord, we ask that you would truly guide your people to honor your name and what they do, that you'll guide us according to your will, and that you'll bring about the result that you desire. So we place it into your hands, dear Lord, and thank you for the comfort and strength and blessing that we can have because of the promises that you have given. And as always, dear Lord, we bring before you our military men and women. We ask that you would enrich and bless their lives, keeping them close to you, placing your loving hand of protection upon them, and walking with them each and every day. And as your people, we are privileged to look to you, and we do this day once again in the prayer that your Son has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take heed, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after the same manner also he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink of it to all of you. This is a New Testament in my blood, which has been shed for you for the remission of all of your sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. May the peace of our Lord be with you always. Amen. You may be seated. Body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, which He
The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant to you his eternal peace. Amen. Just one quick thing. Um, hey, are you still here, Ben? Go on. You must look out. Um, um, I think we have six pumpkin pies that are still available to buy. We had started out with 28 last night. Pumpkin and apple. We're down to just six pumpkin. There are six dollars a piece. The money is going to help the kids get to San Antonio. So if you want a pumpkin pie, you feed the money and you take the pie. Thanks. Right, so pleasant.